Dear Esther, I have lost track of how long I have been here and how many visits I have made overall. Certainly the landmarks are now so familiar to me that I have to remind myself to actually see the forms and shapes in front of me. I could stumble blind across these rocks, the edges of these precipices, without fear of missing my step and plummeting down to sea. Besides, I have always considered that if one is to fall, it is critical to keep one's eyes firmly open. Donnelly reported the legend of the Hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claim to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. The mount is clearly the focal point of this landscape. It almost appears so well placed as to be artificial. I find myself easily slipping into the delusional state of ascribing purpose, deliberate motive to everything here. Was this island formed during the moment of impact? When we were torn loose from our moorings and the seat belts cut motorway lanes into our chests and shoulders, did it first break surface then? When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. 
My lines are just for this. To keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. We are not like Lot's wife, you and I. We feel no particular need to turn back. There's nothing to be seen if we did. No tired old man parting the cliffs with his arms. No gifts or Bibles laid out on the sand for the taking. No tides turning or the shrieking gulls overhead. The bones of the hermit are no longer laid out for the taking. I have stolen them away to the guts of this island, where the passages all run to black, and where we can light each other's faces by their strange luminescence. Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. I would leave you presents outside your retreat in this interim space between cliff and beach. I would leave you loaves and fishes, but the fish stocks have been depleted and I've run out of bread. I would row you back to your homeland in a bottomless boat, but I fear we would both be driven mad by the chatter of the sea creatures. <laughs> 